Hi, everybody. Hello. Um, I'm going to kick off uh, what is number four in our woodwork series. Um, and welcome to the Building Centre, although um, I have to welcome you virtually because we aren't able to open the building right now, although we hope to welcome you soon. So April the 12th is looking um, increasingly likely as our opening day. Um, I'm here in the Conversations About Climate Change exhibition, and you can see the beautiful Sapili Pavilion behind me. And the woodwork is our online lunchtime talk series. Uh, we are actually presenting this in association with the Timber Trade Federation and Wood for Good, and it is aligned to our beautiful exhibition, which you can see on the Building Centre website. There's a virtual iteration of the show, and we're going to have a 360 interactive up by the end of the week, and you'll be able to tour through the exhibition with your hand on your mouse, and it'll be like you're here, um, but we will welcome you back soon. So as I said, this is the fourth in the series of Woodwork Talks. It is on a building called The Rye. It's a South London residential complex, um, which has a very beautifully crafted palette of materials, which we're gonna be hearing a lot more. It's gonna be presented by Tai Takari, who is co-founder of Takari Works. And The Rye won the Gold Award for the 2020 Wood Awards, which is the highest accolade in timber building. It's a beautiful project. Um, it showcases CLT as um, a beautiful, cost-effective and sustainable material. So Tai Takari is an architect and co-founder of Takari Works, a London-based design studio that um, somewhat unusually initiates designs and builds its own projects. And Tai has been working as an architect in London since graduating from the Architectural Association in 2001. And Ty and I have just realized that we worked together at the AA all those years ago. Um, so it's great to see Ty again. And actually there's a very strong link between the Building Center and the Architectural Association. The Building Center started life uh, at the AA under the staircase as a materials bureau. And its intention was to share the best in materials and innovation with an audience of students and architects. Um, and that's something we're trying to do still through the, the public program. So yeah, thank you to Wood for Good and Timber Trade Federation again for supporting this series. Um, it's great to have you with us, Ty. Thank you for giving your time and sharing this exemplary project in timber. So, yeah, Ty, welcome. Hello, hello again. Lovely to see you. And over hi, hi everyone. Hi, thanks for uh, thanks for having us on today. It's um, it's a pleasure to sort of talk to you over this uh, lunchtime uh, talk. Um, let me just uh, get my screen share up here. All right. So hopefully everybody can uh, see that. So we are a small practice, um, normally based out of London Bridge. Um, as as Harriet's uh, kindly sort of introduced already, we're working mainly on London residential projects, uh, some for clients and some which we initiate ourselves. Uh, so the Rye Apartments, which we're going to talk about today, is one of the projects where we acted as client, architect, and main contractor. So I think what's interesting about this uh, approach for us is it enables us to really control, you know, all the aspects of the, 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 the built output. You know, we can get everyone sort of pulling uh, in the same direction and in a more sort of integrated approach. So the office in these self-initiated projects kind of takes more of the role of a, an umbrella organization, um, which, kind of creates a roof over all these different sort of disciplines. So what, what's, what's interesting about that, when you kind of think about the traditional sort of client-led approach is that the, the architectural intent tends to be sort of bookended between the client's financial model and the contractor's uh, construction strategy. And these, these there's not a lot of, um, let's say positive feedback going between these, these disciplines. Everyone's sort of working in their own little bubbles. Um, it's very sort of compartmentalized. And I think when you take on uh, 
all the roles, both client and builder, you, you have the opportunity to, to reconcile this, this more fragmented uh, decision-making process. And I think that's what we were really interested in here on, on the Rye Apartments is to try to think how we could, let's say, optimize this, this interconnected nature of, of finance, of construction, of the env environmental output. So the question for us as designers was, you know, could we come up with a, a language of the building that helped to resolve commercial pressures, construction pressures, and environmental impact? So in 2017, we had the opportunity to acquire this site in Peckham. Uh, it's quite a visible site, which sits at the corner of this wedge-shaped block opposite the park. Um, because of its location, we knew that whatever we did here needed to have a, a strong civic presence to, to create a, an end stop to this block. And also we wanted to give the site back maybe a little bit of importance that um, sort of had been lost throughout the years. Uh, the area around the park, it's a real sort of mixed bag of, of architectural styles and languages and scales. Um, but there are some sort of standout examples of Georgian and Victorian architecture. And we really thought this could you know, form a sort of benchmark for whatever intervention we made on the site. Uh, the site's got two very different scales from east to west. It's quite a long site. So on one end, you've got these two-story red brick Victorians and on the other, uh, larger four-story residential blocks. So kind of the first move we made um, was kind of an obvious response of dividing the program, which was for 10 apartments, uh, into these two blocks. So these two blocks could respond independently to the, the different scales across the site. And then we took what I think we call in the office a sort of form first approach, where what we're trying to do with the form is see how many parameters and constraints we can resolve through formal moves. Um, so rather than a sort of additive process, it's more of a looking at how the shape of a building can resolve, you know, very pragmatic concerns like uh, impact to neighboring gardens, impact for, for daylight, privacy, uh, views in the building, maybe environmental concerns in terms of aspect. Um, and those kind of more programmatic issues, trying to see if we can resolve through a, a formal mechanism. So the, the form's quite sort of plastic in a way. Um, it was important for us as well that these two buildings had a really strong relationship uh, to each other. Um, we thought of them in the office more like a, like a pair of siblings. Um, so they're not identical, um, but there's, there's very much a sort of shared DNA, which is informing the overall composition. Um, it also helps them create a kind of subtle link with their neighbors. And, you know, we explored a lot through models how that end stop of the, of the block could, could work. Um, one of the things that was also an issue on the site was topography. So the site is, is sloping about 1.8 meters from one end to the other. Um, so we, the next move we made was to create this plinth. Um, and what the plinth does is it helps resolve uh, site levels, allows for a, a level garden between the two buildings. Um, and it also kind of reinforces this idea of a, a shared community of homes. Uh, planning wise, it was pretty straightforward in terms of plans. Um, so, you know, really thinking about efficient layouts, minimizing circulation, you know, getting good proportion spaces. Um, so the lower, lower floors are mainly one and two bedroom apartments. And then we've got larger three bedroom duplexes above. Uh, sort of private garden space in the middle. And then a kind of bin and bike store against the main road creating kind of buffer zone. So in the duplex apartments, um, we, we flipped the plans to put the living spaces on underneath the roof, uh, obviously trying to make use of the drama of the roof shape um, and making best use of maximum light and views. 
and then really trying to get the section to work um, you know, as hard as possible. So starting to think about how we can cut in amenity spaces into this roof form, um, starting to think about eave lines. So one of the, the main moves we made was to align the eave line of the building with the neighboring buildings. Um, so what this does, it has the effect of, you know, of course, subtly relating uh, to the neighboring context. Um, but it also creates this opportunity uh, to create a, a more of a, a personal identity for the project. Um, so we allowed the Eve line to cut through window lines, which allowed in a very practical sense, uh, the top and the bottom panes to be controlled differently for, for levels of privacy. And the effect of the cranked window brings light deeper into the spaces. And then just thinking more about atmosphere uh, and trying to, I think we're always trying to reject, let's say more generic uh, plasterboard spaces, which have become kind of ubiquitous. You know, we've sort of stopped thinking about plasterboard as a material and it just becomes a kind of default position. So really we were keen um, to try to create more atmospheric, more visceral spaces. One of the things that was quite important for us was this idea of legibility in the project. Um, so trying to tell the story of, of, of the making, I think was, was quite important. So the, the building can probably best be described as, as three main materials. It's a, it's a concrete plinth, uh, a timber structure, and then clay linings, and then rather than adding to this material palette, you know, working with these three materials uh, through detail, through texture, uh, to create the variation. Um, and I think this idea of legibility and, and the story of making was, was quite important. Um, and it helped us as well to kind of have a very efficient building where there's the minimum number of, 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 of pieces. So this idea of efficiency kind of runs through the project because less materials is less cost. It's also less uh, embodied carbon, uh, less management on site, um, which was a sort of quite important, let's say design feature for us, um, being a small office um, and running this both from a client side, design side and a construction side. You know, we really needed to think about efficiency uh, all the way through the process. So if we just look at the, the plinth uh, as a starting point. So uh, this plinth is doing several things. It's, it's raising the building out of the ground. So it's getting that timber structure away from moisture. Uh, it's getting the shingles um, away from, let's say the ground level where they could be damaged. It's creating a more sort of human scale uh, at, at the pavement level and kind of creating a robust material in which the building can meet the, you know, the quite sort of tough urban condition. As the, the concrete plinth goes around the site, it's changing between uh, garden walls to uh, thermal envelope, and then at some point changes into enclosures for bins and bikes. So we had this idea of, of casting um, the wall as a double-sided concrete wall. So what, what we were trying to do here is this kind of, uh, it's an almost idealized kind of sense of legibility of a building sitting on a concrete plinth. So it's, it's concrete both from inside and out. Uh, internally, you can see here the, uh, the, the concrete walls and the kind of the quality it gives to the, to the spaces, um, you know, creating a bit, of, a bit of difference, a bit of personalization without adding additional materials. So we sandblasted the concrete internally to give it a more softer finish. Um, and then we, we specified a 35% um, a cement replacement mix, which obviously reduces the embodied carbon, but at the same time also gives a, a, a lighter concrete, which aesthetically is more pleasing. So it's a kind of a win-win. And then you can see as that wraps around the front, to create the, the bin and bike enclosures and this buffer zone, which allows a more planted, softer entrance into the buildings. 
And then we have this idea of uh, introducing playfulness and lightness into that concrete. Um, so we made these wedges out of timber to introduce these perforations into the wall uh, as a sort of low tech uh, solution. I think this is a, a sort of an interesting drawing. This was done by the, the project architect um, to sort of engage in the, the way of making in a very sort of detailed way. So he had to become an expert in the metal shuttering panels that we were using, um, enabled to, to coordinate all the information that was required here. So, you know, we've got rebar, we've got perforations, tie bars, um, and all of that had to be communicated into this kind of cohesive pattern that the, the guys on site could understand. So I think when you're taking on more of the process, you're, you're, you're realizing there's sort of gaps um, between let's say a design set of design information and a, and a set of information that's required to actually build something. And then you can see a little bit here in the, the built output. So then sitting on top of this um, concrete plinth is this CLT frame. So really the, the idea of specifying CLT for us was again, there's a strong environmental um, issues associated with it, but then there's also for us, it was about efficiency um, and management. So we tried to get the most out of the material by using it for walls, floors, staircases, internal walls. Um, so we had a kind of single point of management uh, to deliver most of the building. And then really trying to maximize the use of that material. So um, all the switches and sockets were pre-routed into the panels. Uh, stairs went in as the frame went in, which aided in construction. Uh, all the servicing ducting was cut into the panels. And then the precision of the material allowed us to, you know, to be ordering kitchens and windows uh, even before we completed the groundworks, which was advantageous. I think it was a, a really sort of key early decision that we made, which allowed us to approach the project much more systematically. So the whole package, CLT package is manufactured off site. Um, it comes in our case to site in seven deliveries. So this is a time lapse of about a four week period um, where you can see the erection of the, the main building. So there's, there's a lot of information out there about the benefits of CLT and, and most of you are probably familiar with, with those. Um, I think a few sort of key stats for us was the fact that it's the material itself is storing in our case about 200 tons of carbon and that's after the embodied carbon of the making delivery and erection are taken into account. Um, so there's a huge carbon store here. Uh, overall, we put up the frame in, in eight weeks, and that's also including the internal walls, the stairs, and also non-structural components, uh, seven deliveries. And one of the, the, the stats which I really like, which helps to sort of visualize how sustainable the wood is, is that for this volume of timber, it takes three minutes to grow uh, in the Austrian forest over the course of a summer's day. Um, so it's incredibly renewable. And then leaving the CLT unlined. Um, again, this has the advantage of you know, reducing follow on trades, reducing embodied carbon, reducing cost. Um, but that's then on top of the qualitative benefits of having these very warm timber spaces. And then this massiveness of the, the CLT frame is supplemented with more delicate joinery elements made out of uh, spruce strips or uh, 18 mil CLT boards. Um, that we source directly from Germany. And we use these for joinery elements like cabinets and kitchens. You know, where appropriate, we relied on, you know, low tech solutions, but sometimes it made sense to, to start to use more digital fabrication techniques. So for example, here you can see we've added texture into the 18 mil CLT boards uh, by using CNC. 
we've added um, created vent grills for the MVHR system again out of the CNC paneled um, and there's even an AOV vent which is which is CNC and then it sort of all comes together here in, in one of the kitchens uh, I'm just conscious of time here I'm just going to race through a little um, so one of the things to create a bit of variation between the units is having these um, black kitchens to the one and two bedroom units um, and these are made from a recycled um, timber fiber, uh, which is em embodied in a sort of a resin panel. Um, and this is called product called Valcormat, and it's it's through colored, so it's very hardy for kitchens. And then the the, the worktops are made from compressed paper, again in a kind of bound in, in resin, which traditionally it's used for skate ramps or the the fretboards on a guitar. So what was nice about this material, it was quite sort of consistent with the ethos uh, of the project, but again, it added a bit of variation. And then linking the inside spaces to the outside um, through the use of these red quarry tiles to link to the language of the shingles, which adds a bit of utility, it adds a bit of thermal mass. And then the final element is the, the shingle tiles on the outside. Um, so really the idea here of trying to link the building to its red, brown, brick context. So a material which has a familiar color and texture, but at the same time, the scale of the material and the, and the use of it on walls and roofs creates a kind of uh, ambiguity. And I think we liked playing with this idea of creating a productive tension between something which is familiar and something which is new. These are all handmade in, in Denmark, 10,000 shingles at Peterson Table. And then they're hung as a ventilated rain screen, which allows the timber to breathe um, and like keeps to the kind of principles of, of, end, of, end, of end of life. So everything's dry fixed uh, and it can all be disassembled and easily recycled. And then just seeing how it all comes together um, with the main block here and some of the outside spaces amenity spaces that are cut into the roofs. And then the overall urban composition. So I'm just a little over on time, but um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ty. That was so interesting. Um, the host has asked me to start my video, so I will press. Hopefully everyone can see me now here. I come back into you. Thank you. That was um, a great presentation. It's such a beautiful project. I should add, anyone that wants to ask a question can do so via the Q&A function on Zoom and I will ask Ty. My first question, Ty, um, to you is give, given the sort of beauty of CLT and the efficiency on site and the fact that it negates needs for other trades, why are we so addicted to plasterboard? Um, I think it's a, it's become such a, a default that it's it's we're not even thinking of it as a material, you know. I mean, specifying a plasterboard wall is is the same as specifying a timber wall or a brick wall, but we're not even thinking of it in in, in sort of material terms. And I think a lot of developers are also, um, you know, they're really afraid of moving too far away from generic spaces. They're trying. It's a sort of a please please everyone approach which I think in the end, you know, we're, we're sort of missing something, you know, people, people don't hate the spaces, but at the same time, they don't love them. And I think what we were trying to do here is, is, is take a position and be quite personal about it um, with the hope that people will, will be able to engage with that and relate to it. And I think from our experience, it's, it's proven successful, you know, um, sure. There are some people that won't like it, um, you know, some people say it's it's like living in a sauna. Fair enough, but then they're the the ones that do like it. They really, you know, they really like it, and I think that's important. Someone was asking initially whether you uh, work with any of the sort of timber trade bodies, like Wood for Good, or to kind of share this experience and to give advice on how maybe house building itself might move forward. Um, I mean, we haven't at the moment. I mean, we're a, we're a, we're a tiny practice, um, and I think we're at the kind of start of our our journey, um, especially with this project. I think we learned a lot from it. 
Um, and I think our ideas of, of house building, of sustainability are, are evolving. So I think we're kind of right at the beginning steps. And I think that's probably something we're looking to do is, is to work with these larger federations and manufacturers so we can become more specialized in it as well. Yeah, I mean, you must be sort of gathering a huge amount ex of experience with working with materials that, that would be helpful to share. And I guess that's the beauty of listening to your presentation is that we can see how you, you utilize those. And there's a couple of questions actually that refer to the CLT in particular. Uh, Marco says, how did you protect the CLT during construction? And Ed um, asks, was there a complexity to leaving the party walls as exposed CLT, bearing in mind fire and acoustic requirements? Um, yeah, I mean, kind of taking those in order. So the, um, we worked with Urban um, as, the, as the subcontractor and they they've got a sort of a system of how they approach when they're dealing with visual panels so those are all protected as the floors are erected um you really the what you're protecting from is uv um because that's the biggest danger in terms of discoloration so um that was an issue um we were also putting the frame up in the middle of winter which was suboptimal but that's just how how, how it came to be um, yes, fire, acoustics, I mean, those are all technical considerations that just have to be resolved. Um, we did a twin party wall, which allowed us to service in the cavity and deal with acoustics. And another thing you looked at at the end was those really beautiful tiles. I mean, Peterson Tegel, Tegel, if I'm saying, mm -hmm. I mean, what an, an amazing manufacturer of, of bricks and tiles. Was that something you'd had experience with before using that kind of? I mean, we've used, we've used, you can see Peterson behind me. Um, so <laughs> yeah, uh, a... we do, we do yeah. like their bricks. Yeah. Um, the shingles was the first time for us on this. Um, I think it just sort of, yeah, we wanted to keep a real sort of monolithic form. So, you know, the, a material that could be used on walls and, and roofs was sort of important. A few people have asked how it's, how the facade is dealing with rainwater. We haven't had any rain for a few days. <laughs> How um, well, we finished this about a year ago. So um, yeah, it's, it's dealing with it. So, I mean, it's a kind of, it's, it's quite a traditional material, um, you know, hung tiles, um, especially the way it's, it's used here. I mean, it's kind of goes back um, quite a ways. So I think if it's detailed correctly, it's, it's fine. Yes, it's very beautiful. I mean, the CLT use is, is drawing a lot of questions actually. Um, so Pete asks, are there skills, resources for greater rollout of CLT? There seem to be armies of dry liners, but CLT seems more skilled. Are there, are, is, I mean, it seems to be a material that's increasingly discussed. I mean, certainly through the projects we've been doing here at the building center, it's something that is coming up, you know, increasingly as the material of choice. Is, is there the sort of resources in terms of information and trade? And sort of back up to get you talked about urban i guess a specialist yeah i think i mean there is a i mean there's still only a handful of specialists in the uk with clt um which is probably a, a limiting factor in terms of its its mass rollout but there's been enough clt projects done where there's you know a, a really good um evidence of of all the different factors so all the information all the resourcing is there i think there's probably just a limit in terms of the number of uh, subcontractors in the UK that are delivering it. Brilliant. I mean, it's it's a great project. And you talked in the project about the story of making, which I thought was a very sort of poetic way of describing the process of, of your particular project and the work that you're doing as an architect. And it's brilliant that you could share the story of, of making with us. We've come to perfectly timing, actually, of um, half past one. So I would like to say a yeah, big thank you to you, Ty, and also thank you to um, the team here at the Building Centre who you mentioned earlier. So I've been Vanessa Norwood. I have to say a big thank you to Harriet Jennings, who's been controlling us behind the scenes, Ty and I, and to Matilde Savary as well in the Building Centre team. Next week, we've got um, a Brazilian project. Gustavo Utrabo will be talking about the children's village. Um, lots more woodwork talks to come. So please do join us. You can book up the talks on the Building Centre website and we look forward to 
um, welcoming everyone back to the building center as soon as possible. Yeah, thank you so much, Ty, for joining us. That was a great. Thank you. Take care. Cheers. Bye. Bye.